We want to take a moment just to recognize our fathers and dads and those of you that have maybe not had a child but have had maybe even an opportunity to be a blessing to a young person in your life. Uh, I think uh, at our last service, Ralph was here who's um, been a home and a place for many international students to stay through the years and a father figure uh, to many international students. Um, as we're going to pray in just a moment, I was thinking about my own journey with my dad, the ups and downs, and um, I was ministering to a friend this week who's been going through a ch challenging time with his family and just finding myself telling them, you know, the grace of God that you've been experiencing, that it's allowed you to move towards sobriety and allowed you to move towards a healthier place in your life. It's not only that God is giving you grace to know who he is, grace to choose to follow Jesus, but even as you've received forgiveness from God, he wants to give you that forgiveness in its fullness that you can be able to forgive um, your mother, to forgive your father. And as we say thanks um, for our fathers, sometimes that thanks is an expression of forgiveness because let's be honest, we're all broken, we're all human. And as my friend Matt was reminding me today, it goes both ways. It's like there's ways um, not only that we need to extend forgiveness uh, to our fathers, but we need forgiveness uh, from our earthly fathers. You know, there's the ups and downs um, that we experience in our very human, very um, frail existence as father and son and daughter and father. And so we just want to say thanks, realizing that it is hard work to be a dad, and yet it is good work. And so if you're a dad here today or you've had the opportunity to pour into somebody's life, would you please stand the fathers in our midst? And we just want to say a prayer of blessing over you. Lord, today I thank you for the fathers in this room, for those who have invested time and energy and um, tears and prayers and all the ways they have poured into the next generation. Let your blessing rest upon them. May your favor uh, just impassion them for the continued journey of fatherhood. Um, may your joy uh, just bubble up in them as they enjoy their children. Lord, thank you for the fathers in our midst. Thank you for their faithfulness. And thank you, Lord, that you are a father to us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give our dads a hand this morning. So my friend uh, that I was referencing, um, I met him uh, many years ago. Uh, <clears throat> my wife and I moved to our very first district. We started out in pastoral ministry in Colorado Springs, and we were there for 10 months in a kind of internship kind of a situation. And one night I got a call from my conference president at the time, Jim Brower, we had just, interestingly enough, been hiking the incline in Manitou Springs, which is an old cog railway that literally goes up the side of the foothills of Pikes Peak. It goes one mile straight up. Old railroad ties, and they're not even. And, um, you know, I thought I was relatively in shape, but evidently not, because literally as I got a ways into that, I was literally like lifting one leg up to put it on the next step and then lifting another leg. And I'm not a big mantra kind of a fellow, but that particular experience brought a mantra. At first I was like, let me try and write a song. Well, the song kind of became more of a mantra. And as I would lift one leg, it would be every step you take 
And then I would let, I am with you. I think it was every step I, you take, I am with you. I'd lift my leg, put it up, and then I'd lift the next leg and go, I am with you every step of the way. And just did that one step at a time until finally got to the top and drove back. And as if that wasn't enough of a kind of invigorating, challenging experience, then I get back uh, to our little home there in Colorado Springs, just 1,100 square foot, first little home that we rented together. And um, I get a call from our conference president. He's like, Jim, are you sitting down? I'm like, well, should I be? You, you might want to sit down. Oh, okay. So I found a chair. He says, we would like to have you consider um, going to northern Wyoming I'm like, okay, um, and what's involved with that? Well, it's four churches and a startup group, a company, which ironically was larger than the smallest church. Had about 30 people in the company in Cody, Wyoming, and the smallest church, 10 Sleep, Wyoming, had about 10 people. And I'm like, do I have any choice in the matter? <laughs> and he said, well... We don't want to like force you to go there, but we're highly recommending it and we'd like you to pray over it and come for an interview. And I'm like, whoo. Well, we ended up there and we moved to the town of Warland and we um, got approved to buy our first home, 1112 Grace Avenue. We had to do some painting and remove some peeling paint off the side of the house and get everything and our the stuff was in storage for quite some time, and we got occupancy, and there was nothing in the dining room, nothing in the living room. I think maybe we had a bed. Maybe we were actually sleeping still at the neighbor's house. We were also church members, but we had occupancy, and I remember one day kneeling down on the dining room floor with all that, that was there was the, the, sh the light fixture hanging from the ceiling and saying, Lord Jesus, will you help us reach our neighbors uh, for you? And as we are praying, in the very midst, we hear music, a guitar. And it kind of sounded like... It was some kind of Latin vibe. Um, the, the notes were in thirds, and, and we get done praying, and Ingrid says, hey, do you hear that guitar? I'm like, yeah, and we both look out the window, and here was a Hispanic gentleman on his back deck playing a guitar. She's like, get over there. Get your guitar and go over there, which I happen to have my guitar. I didn't put that in storage. Go over there and play with them. And I'm like, I don't know that style of music. That doesn't matter. You know guitar, don't you? You know, sometimes it feels like I married the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I do know the Holy Spirit talks to my wife. <laughs> and so off I went, and we did this false modesty thing that uh, guitarists sometimes do. And I, I said, well, why don't you play some? I'm not that good. I don't really. You play some. And I was like, well, and we're going back and forth. And finally, his little boy, Mr. Ryan, they called him Mr. Ryan. He was about two or three, but he had jet black hair parted on the side. I swear he was wearing a little vest. I mean, that's how I remember it in my memory. Mr. Ryan comes, and he comes up, and he's looking at the guitar, and he points to a little picture on the guitar. It was a decal. It was like, like a half inch wide by an inch tall and it was Jesus knocking at the door. And I was like, well, what song is that? And the gentleman says, oh, he says, that's one day at a time. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. And I was like, oh. Now, believe it or not, I didn't grow up on country music. I apologize. But I knew of that song. I knew of that song. Now, I didn't really know how to play it very well, except for the fact that about six months later, before we had moved to Wyoming, there was a Hispanic woman 
Uh, her husband had died, and I was visiting, and we were ministering to her, and she said, can you learn that song? She was elderly, maybe 75 or so. Can you learn that song one day at a time? Because I'd, I'd been going to her house. I'd take my guitar, sing a song or two. And I was like, okay. And this was in the early days of Google, but lo and behold, I was able to find some chords, find the resources I needed. I learned the song, went back and played it for her. Little did I know, fast forward six months later on that back deck with that Hispanic gentleman, that that would become a connecting point. We just prayed, Lord, help us to reach our neighbors. And little did I know that the young man I referred to today that was going through some stuff in terms of his family, that gentleman wasn't his father. It was, it was a boyfriend of his mother. That gentleman, or they would... I would befriend them and meet this young man. We've been journeying together for the last six years, just on this journey. And there was something that happened that brought me even all the way to where I'm at today. What happened was is the gentleman and the woman he was living with, we became friends. They eventually asked us to do their wedding. Um, that, ex that first experience happened in the summer of 1999. Fast forward um, to November of 2000, sometime in that fall, um, the woman, uh, this young man's mother, started to leave voice messages on our answering machine saying, Jim, can you come over and help us with our computer? Now, I didn't really know anything about computers other than like how to use a word processor, but like any kind of repair kind of stuff, software repair or hardware repair, I didn't have a clue. But somehow she thought I knew something about computers and she kept leaving voice messages and I kept ignoring them thinking, I don't know anything about computers. Until one night, because this was a big district, it was like uh, I would drive 2,500 to 3,000 miles a month. It was 90 miles to the other side of the district. And one night, I'm driving back from the other side of the district, and this thought goes through my mind. And the thought was, you know what? You're praying for these little churches to grow, and you're asking God to do something. And, and you got neighbors that are calling you up and leaving messages on your answering machine. Can you give us tech support? Why not start with your neighbors. Duh. Okay. Um, so then, then a couple days after that, um, I was in my quiet time. Journal entry, November 24, 2000. In this verse, as I'm reading for Deuteronomy for my, my personal time with God, just jumped off the page at me. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 1 and 3, simply says this. You shall not watch your neighbor's ox or sheep straying away and ignore them. You may not withhold your help. Well, they didn't have an ox or a sheep, but they had a computer, and it was evidently straying. And God's tapping me on the shoulder. They need help. And it's just like, okay, I get it. I get it. I get it. And so I ended up going over, and you know what? We never talked about computers. We never even got to computers. But Abel uh, says to me, you know, we get into his story. We get into how he had, had once upon a time attended church and, and known Jesus. And I found myself saying, well, you know what? You're never really going to be fully fulfilled until you kind of, you know, exit the off-ramp, make a U-turn, and return to the Lord. I, I, I don't think you're going to find what you're looking for if you don't just return, which is where our passage is at today, um, uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14, and if you have a Bible, you're welcome to look it up and read from your Bible, or you can look on the screen, but I'm going to go old school, at least for our passage of focus, Jeremiah uh, chapter um, 3 and verse 14, Jeremiah 3, 14, and the same God that gave me the opportunity to say to this neighbor, hey, you know, have you considered returning? He said the same thing millennia before when he's talking to his people, Israel. 
and his people Judah. And this was what he says in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14. He says, Return faithless people, declares the Lord, for I am your husband. I will choose you, one from a town and two from a clan, and bring you to Zion. Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. In those days when your numbers have increased greatly in the land, declares the Lord, people will no longer say the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It will never enter their minds or be remembered. It will not be missed, nor will another one be made. At that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of God. You won't need the ark because your very community will become the place of God's dwelling. And all the nations will gather in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord. No longer will they follow the stubbornness of their evil hearts. And so what you have here in this passage is contextually God is comparing his relationship with his people to a marriage. And, and, and he's calling out to them as if he were their husband, giving them promises. He's renewing his vows with his people. And he simply starts that renewal of the vows by saying, I will choose you, one from a town, two from a clan, and I'll bring you to Zion. I'll bring you home. I'll bring you back to ground zero. And I think sometimes looking around this room in our services as we're without a senior leader and, you know, in a community like this, sometimes things happen, people drift, they choose to check out and shop around churches, and, and that's fine. I mean, I, you know, I think we need to say, where is God having us to be in our fellowship with the body of Christ? And, and to obviously be prayerful about that, not to choose where we would fellowship like we choose a restaurant, but to prayerfully say, God, where would you have me to be? And in the midst of that reality that we all know takes place and people are making all kinds of choices about where they're going to fellowship, where they're going to worship, we still have a God that says, you know what? I have chosen you. And there are people that I'm choosing right now in this region, one from a town and two from a clan. You've prayed for your family. You have sons and daughters and parents and Grandparents, people in your tribe, in your clan that you're praying for, and God says, I have not forgotten your prayers, and I am going to bring the people you're praying for. I'll bring them into your circle of influence. I'll bring them into your home. I'll bring them into your Sabbath school class. I'll bring them into this worship space. Don't stop praying. Don't stop banking on my promises because I'm still alive and well. I'm still your husband. I'm still your Lord. I'm still your father. I still care, and I'm going to bring him. That's not the only promise he makes. He says this. He says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. I'm not only going to bring people to your fellowship and people into the sphere of your influence that you might bless them with the love of Jesus. But I'm going to bring you leadership, shepherds that will help to come alongside and empower you as you seek to be an influence for God's kingdom to that one from your town and two from your clan. I'm going to bring you shepherds. And I just want to make this kind of, I mean, it's, it's not rocket science, but he has given us shepherds, and he will give us shepherds. In times of transition, sometimes it's easy to panic. Well, have you heard what's going on with the search committee? Do you know where they're at in the process? How many people do they have on the list? It, I think this person would be good. I can tell you from personal experience that I'm going to get to that in a little bit. Man, if you land here in this community, at this church, at this time in your life, as, as flawed as we can sometimes think that search processes are, there's way more going on than just the humanity of that reality. There is a God who is guiding, who says to us, I will bring you a shepherd. I will bring you shepherds. 
And somehow he works through us all in the process, whether we're praying, whether we're part of a search team, wherever we're at, he's working through all of us that, to remind all of us that he is the one that sends shepherds. And this is what he does for every shepherd. I know from hearing the stories of shepherds and I know from my own personal journey, to each shepherd, he says at least two things. I have chosen you and I will go with you. I have chosen you and I will go with you. Jeremiah chapter 1.5 um, before I shaped you in the womb, and I like the way the message says it, before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. He said that to Jeremiah, who would become a prophet. He said it to my heart, who chose pastoral ministry. But he says it to your heart, whether you're a, a mechanic or a lawyer or a physician or, or a service worker, wherever you're at in your journey, you're not just there by happenstance. You are chosen. Furthermore, he goes on, Deuteronomy chapter 31, not only are you chosen, but we find when Moses spoke these words to the apprentice Joshua that there was an exhortation and a promise uh, from the, the, that to this new shepherd that God was choosing for Israel. And in that promise, it's not only a promise to Joshua, it's a promise to you and me. He says, be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And maybe for someone here today, you are going to a land. You're making a shift. You're making a change. And God's words to Joshua are words to you. I will go with you. I will go before you. But not only will I go before you, but listen to what he said to the shepherd boy David. David accounting his experience with God. He says, oh Lord, you have searched me, Lord, and you have known me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain it. In his message, you see, he is saying to us, I'll go before you, I come behind you. We heard that from Pastor Curcio when he was with us on May 20th, and, and he shared his favorite passage promise of a faithful shepherd who says in Psalm 23, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. He's gone before us, but he comes behind us. And so Curcio shared this little story of how his public school teacher, Mrs. Landers, taught the Greek alphabet to his language arts class in the sixth grade. And he's thinking to himself as a sixth grader, why? And then he's like, oh yeah, I need extra credit. And then 10 years later, he's in graduate school and the God who had gone before him in his sixth grade language arts class comes behind him during seminary Greek to remind him of the good shepherd whose goodness and mercy had followed him all the days of my life. Yo, Mr. Curcio, remember sixth grade Greek alphabet? I was preparing you for this moment here, this is my affirmation to you that my goodness and mercy has been following you all the days of your life. And what you thought was some random off-the-wall requirement of your teacher was my way of saying, I am preparing you. And now I'm coming behind to say, hey, hey, remember that? Remember? Now, Curcio isn't the only shepherd God sent us. I mean, he's here present tense, and he came as a shepherd for our youth. And having interacted with him, he is truly a shepherd after God's own heart. Last week, Pastor Sherry Smith retired, a, a shepherd emeritus. She shared with us and reminded her through our, her personal testimony of the Lord's promise never to leave us and never to forsake us. After her earthly father had died from cancer, 
Jesus taught Sherry to hear the voice of her heavenly father by leading her through a process of personalizing the promises of God's word and praying them back to him. In her prayer closet, Lord, you said, Sherry, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I'm just, my heart is breaking and I need you now. Be my father now that my father is gone. And in that process, she began to recognize the voice of the Good Shepherd as we heard in our scripture reading this morning. My, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hands. My sheep hear my voice. I give them eternal life. And that life eternal isn't something that just happens tomorrow. As the scripture says, I think it's First John, he who has the Son has life. He who has the Son knows the voice of the shepherd. And that life-giving voice will lead your steps and your decision-making in your life present tense, right here, right now, where you sit and where I stand, the shepherd is here speaking. Can you hear his promise? Do you sense his presence? In the presence of her shepherd, Sherry felt secure. His voice was that source of comfort and healing and strength after the death of her earthly father that awakened and opened up for her a clarity of calling to help those in grief and loss to recognize the voice of their Heavenly Father. Like Pastor Curcio, God gave us Pastor Sherry as a shepherd after his own heart. And while she's retired, she still shepherds the person, people in her circle of influence. She still shows up at hospital rooms. She still comes to conduct funerals. In addition, God has given us Pastor Melody to carry on the torch of member care that Sherry was leading. Our current and former pastors are a reminder that God has given us shepherds, and he will give us shepherds. Just as he gave us Pastor Ferguson and Pastor Eckenroth as shepherds after his own heart, he will give us a new lead pastor. He'll give us a new associate pastor as shepherds. After his own heart. He is the God who goes before and comes behind. Which is why I'm confident. I am confident and I feel like I can say right now in this moment, God is laying promises on the hearts of our new leadership. Just as he gave promises to our former leaders and has given promises to our current leaders, he has given promises is giving promises to our future leaders. Right now, he is speaking to them. In this moment, he's calling them. In this moment, his promise is to be with them. I'm not only confident because of promises given to my colleagues, but I am here because of a promise. I am here because God chose to speak into our world when we were more than happy to be living in southern Colorado surrounded by the Rockies and skiing in the winter and the joy of that wide open space. Two days before we flew on a frontier flight from Denver, Colorado, here into Chattanooga for our on-site interview in 2015, the Lord gave us a promise. In the case of that promise, it was buried in an obscure story in the book of 2 Kings. It doesn't sound like a promise because in the story, it is a command from the prophet Elijah to King Jehoram of Israel. The story begins with King Jehoram soliciting the help of King Jehoshaphat of Judah and the help of King Edom to join him in a war initiative against the king of Moab. After the death of King Jehoram's father, who was Ahab, that would have made his mother, I guess, Jezebel, 
Misha, the Moabite king, rebelled against Joram by refusing to pay the agreed-upon tribute that had been set up between Ahab and Misha of 100,000 lambs and along with the wool of 100,000 rams. And so, so Jehoram goes and he recruits Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom, and these three kings make an agreement, we're going to go to war against Moab. However, once they gather their troops and they gather their armies and they start to make their way toward the battlefront, after a seven-day circuitous, circuitous, however you say that, route of marching around, they run out of water. And Jehoram's conclusion in this crisis echoes the grumbling complaints of the children of Israel in the wilderness after the exodus from Egypt. Here's what he says. He's like, what? exclaims the king of Israel, has the Lord called us three kings together only to deliver us into the hands of Moab? In other words, why has the Lord led us into this desert to die? But King Jehoshaphat's trust was in the God who sends shepherds after his own heart. And he says to Jehoram, is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? Then one of the king of Israel's servants answered. <laughs> Not even Jehoram answers, but his servant goes, Oh, oh hey, hey, hey. Um, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, the, Lord, the word of the Lord is with him. Now, how did Jehoshaphat know that? Was it because Elijah had a reputation and thereby he would, okay. I, somehow he knew. I would say it's probably the spirit. And so the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to where Elisha was. And Elisha said to the king of Israel, what have I have to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father Abraham. Go to the prophets of your mother Jezebel. But the king of Israel said, no, it is the Lord who has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. He's still hung up on his narrative that we're just doomed. And Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, were it not that I have regard for Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would neither look at you nor see you. Elisha was willing to speak with Jehoram because of Jehoshaphat's faith in the God who sends faithful shepherds. In other words, should we not be asking the same question of Jehoshaphat? Is there no prophet of the Lord here? God, who do you want to send who can bring your word? You know, if we're hung up on our circumstances, if all we can believe is that we've been led into the desert to die, it's easy to lose sight of the good shepherd who has promised to send shepherds after his own heart. Now, trust me, in Tennessee, we're not in a desert. We're surrounded by green. But sometimes we can be susceptible to, that, to desert thinking. Sometimes we can fall prey to, what are we going to do? But the question is not what we're going to do. The question is, what is God doing? And how are we going to pray in agreement with what he is doing? May we continue to ask, Father God, who are the shepherds you're seeking for our church family at this time? I know personally that people were praying long before our family began to consider a move to Collegedale. Dave Smith informed me on June 23rd, we flew out here on June 21st, had a two-day interview process, and he informed me that afternoon that the church had been planning and praying for three years for God to make a way for there to be a worship pastor here. And as he's telling me those words, I'm just weeping. I'm weeping because of the words I'm about to share with you and the fact that the words Dave was sharing was in harmony with what God had already been saying. And there is nothing more convicting and compelling than when you know you're somewhere because God put you there. And so the Lord's answer was the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts through 
this request of Elijah after he's had this kind of contentious exchange with Jehoram and says, I wouldn't even be speaking to you if it wasn't for the faith of Jehoshaphat who trusts in a God who sends faithful shepherds. The Lord's response to Elisha is, but now bring me a musician. And when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. In Elisha's command to Jehoram, Ingrid and I heard the Holy Spirit. In those words, bring me a musician, I sense Jesus speaking to my heart. Jim, I'm calling you and your family to Collegedale. I'll be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will provide for your needs. Now, it wasn't just the words in them of themselves. It wasn't just the phrase, bring me a musician. But it was the Holy Spirit's timing of bringing that phrase to our attention. As I had mentioned, I first read that on June 20th, two days before we boarded the fl frontier flight for Chattanooga. And that was just happened to be within a Bible reading plan that we were working through. It wasn't on our radar. It was in no way intended or planned. Yet because of the Holy Spirit's timing and because of God's specificity, I believe before boarding that flight that we would be invited to come to College Dale, and when the invitation was extended, we would need to say yes. Why? Because it was God's invitation. Because his spirit spoke through his word to our hearts, and then that was confirmed by his church. And that's my prayer for the shepherds Jesus is inviting to lead to our team. My prayer is, Lord Jesus, give clarity to the shepherds you're about to send. Lay a promise on their hearts. Give them courage and confidence that you are calling them to college now. Be faithful to your promise to never leave them nor forsake them. And so we're going to conclude today by praying for our shepherds. But before we conclude, I have one last thing to say, and it is this. In Peter, who is writing to the church, he says, you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You have been called out of darkness and into God's marvelous light to declare and to proclaim the praises of him who called you. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. Dare I say that you are shepherds for the people in your circle of influence. Right now, where you sit, in your mind is a group of people, family, friends, co-workers, acquaintances, the barista at the coffee shop that you go to and get hot tea. Where, whoever it is, you have a circle of influence and God is saying to you today, I have called you as a royal priesthood. A minister. And the New King James Revelation says you are kings and priests. And what were the kings? The, the king that was known as the king with a heart after God's. I will choose for myself a man after my own heart. He started out as what? A shepherd. And God is saying you are my shepherd for the people in your circle. And there are people in your circle that Pastor Moon will never reach. People in your circle that Professor King will never reach. People in your circle that Dave and Chris, as they have moved on to new circles and new callings, they will never reach. But I'm not looking for them to reach these people. I am calling you. And you say, but I don't know how to give a Bible study. I don't know how to... You know, get, you know, get them into the baptistry tank. Friends, there are so many other ways to shepherd. And if they're meant to be in Bible study and in baptismal tanks, God will get them there. But right now, he's inviting you as the shepherd for your circle to simply ask yourself and those that you serve, how can I help this person take their next best step? either toward Jesus because they haven't surrendered yet or with Jesus because they're just trying to figure out how to follow the shepherd 
You are the shepherd for the person in your circle. And today I ask you this promise as we prepare to pray for the shepherds God will send. I ask you this. What is the promise God is laying on your heart? Let that sit with you. Take that with you from this place and wrestle with Jesus and say, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? What are you trying to tell me from your word? What are you trying to tell me through that critical conversation that happened this past week or is about to happen? Where are you calling me? Who are you calling me to? And what is your promise in the midst? Because I know you have a word for me, Jesus. So two things today. Pray for the shepherds that God wants to send and ask him how he wants to send you. Ask him for that promise that he has for you right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the shepherds that you have, that you're speaking to at this moment. I know you're speaking because you spoke to me. I know you're speaking because you spoke to Pastor Sherry and Pastor Curcio and Pastor Dave and Pastor Chris and Pastor Tim and Pastor Melody, and we could go down the list. Lord, we're not here by accident. Not only the paid staff, but Lord, every person in this room is here because you've called them and you have a purpose and a plan and you say to each of us, I have chosen you and I will never leave you nor forsake you and I need you for the circle that I've placed you in. Be my shepherd. Jesus, anoint us with your spirit and empower us to love and to lead for the glory of your name that your kingdom may be full of sheep (laughs) who are paradoxically shepherds, followers and leaders, all walking after our Savior and Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus, and speak in your name.